On this week's U.S. Farm Report, a special visit with Mr. Ed Wimmer, Vice President of the National Federation of Independent Business. So, stay tuned. Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. This week, I'm delighted to welcome, as a special guest, Mr. Ed Wimmer. Ed is Vice President of the National Federation of Independent Business. Ed, you're really no stranger by any means to NFO audiences, and for that matter, rural audiences across the country. In fact, you, you've gotten into about 50 states telling the farm story, haven't you? Well, I would say that my strangeness, as far as NFO is concerned, is about as strange as the story that I've been telling about the family farmer since 1932. The reason that I got so excited about NFO three years ago, when they invited me to address those 35,000 people that gathered at uh, Des Moines, which was the largest audience that I understand that ever happened in agriculture, it broke all records. And I'd been trying from 1932 on up to 1967 to make the independent merchant on Main Street, the people generally, especially our young people, the local bankers understand that they had a common cause with the family farmer. Also, I was trying to get the family farmer to understand that he had a common cause with the man on Main Street, that if the man on the farm was sick, the man on Main Street was sick, and if the man on Main Street was sick, the guy on Constitution Avenue was going to be mm -hmm. sick sooner or later. And it wasn't until this big meeting in Des Moines and what followed afterwards that there was any real get-together on communications in the United States. And you know when you've been out talking with family farm and small business and local bank being the three pillars of our free enterprise system and our free society and democracy and the uh, Jeffersonianism and Madison and the Declaration of Independence. I even had the Sermon in the Mount in my talk to try to prove that all of those documents were all based on one thing, and that was the, the raising the dignity of the individual. Mm -hmm. And that the, a democracy is only great because a democracy offers more nobodies a chance to be somebody, to climb up the ladder, to grab a hold of that bottom lung, rung, and get themselves up there in that middle class, and if they could, maybe get up there with uh, among the millionaires. And uh, I've been one of those kind of people that I know that big business is here to stay. Without big business, I couldn't travel all over this United States as I have to make those big planes and to be here in Corning tonight and Des Moines tomorrow and somewhere else the next day. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have big labor unions. It doesn't make any difference what anybody says or what the, any of the and manufacturers uh, uh, say about it. We're going to have big labor unions. And the worker is entitled to bargain for a fair wage. We're going to have big banks. We're going to have big government because this is a big country. But if we don't have fair wages, fair prices, and fair profits all the way down the line, if the family farmer isn't getting his share of the income, he's not going to be able to buy those high-priced products that comes out of the factory. And somehow or other, there hasn't been communications until the last two or three years through the NFO and our NFIB and the Independent Bankers Association, National Association of Retail Druggists, a few other organizations that have all of a sudden awakened that they're all in the same boat, that the boat's leaking, that there's a, an inflation hole in one place and a, a bankruptcy hole somewhere else, and now they've all started their bailing and they're sort of to start to row together. And when those 32 organizations got together in St. Louis, the first time that farmers actually got together and agreed on a set of fundamental principles, and, and I think we're working ourselves up to a point now where the small businessman and the family farmer, and the local banker particularly, are going to be able to jointly get their story across to the policymakers of this country and to these economists and educators 
who had been saying for years and years if we could just keep farm prices down, mm -hmm. we're going to have prosperity. Ed, I think it's in order that you tell our viewers something about the Federation. I belong to the Federation, and I'm among how many other members? Well, right now, the last report that I got was 284,000. And I think oh. it's important for people to know how you function and what the Federation does. Uh, well, we have 300 men in the field. And these 300 men make about 3,000 contacts a day. And whether they sell a man a membership or not, and they only call on independent business people and independent professional people and farmers. We have a great number of farmers in our organization, particularly in, in Iowa and, and the agricultural states. And the reason that we've taken the farmers into our organization the last eight or ten years, and particularly the last two or three years, is because that farmer then begins to find out the problems of the of the businessman. The businessman better learns the problems of the farmer. And I hate to say this, but I think it, that anybody will agree that probably uh, several years back, the bankers thought more of, of being able to get a farm for some doctor. And the farmer was going out. And they didn't realize that as those farmers were going out, the depositors, the, the, the grocers, the doctors, the lawyers, the, the school buses full of laughing children, the churches full of pews, that this was really the backbone of this bank. And when we got into this liquidation of nearly three million family farms since 1950, you can imagine what this has done to banking and what it has done to yeah. business. Now, when our men go down the street, they'll usually maybe take a, a poll on how this businessman feels about four or five different pieces of legislation. And we have farm bills, of course, on our, our mandates. And then we have 2,500 chairmen that compile our ballots. And these ballots are sent in to the members of Congress. Then after the ballots are, are, are counted and compiled and the results taken, then we supply all the newspapers in the United States, all the radio stations, television stations, and about 3,000 3, different types of associations with the results that we've gotten. Mm -hmm. And without a doubt, it's the greatest poll-taking uh, operation that the world has ever seen. And of course, now that we, that we have such, such a close relationship with what NFO is trying to do and getting a fair price for farm products. Uh, the farmer, and so of course, people that listen to your, to your country program, they've heard it over and over and over again about how the farmer comes to town and he says, how much will you give me? Now uh, the shirt maker and the worker that bargains in a union, the grocer that puts his coffee on the shelf, the, the dentist that sets his uh, price for teeth and the doctor for his call and the the prescription at the drugstore, everybody that has anything to sell, as a rule, sets the price for it. But the farmer has always had to take what he has been, could get. And when these gigantic corporate combines begin to build up and get such enormous purchasing power, uh, a few buying the lamb, a few buying the beef, a few buying uh, uh, the canned goods, uh, then this went back, of course, to the grower of the vegetables. Mm -hmm. And this tremendous power was seen by Herbert Hoover. You know, he's after all, we're in Iowa, and this is the birthplace of, of Hoover, and he was blamed for the Depression, and of course the poor fellow uh, really didn't have anything to do with the Not Depression thing, because he was helpless in yeah. those days. But he said in 1934 that we're building up an economic autocracy upon which a political autocracy will rise. Now, at the same time, the CED, which has changed its colors in, in, uh, entirely in its thinking, with the Committee for Economic Development, at, that, at just about that time, the CED issued a report and they said, no free society can be built on any foundation that doesn't guarantee a maximum of individual enterprise and a minimum of power in the hands of the few. And yet CED came out here last year, I believe it was, in which they said that there were too many farmers. Now, if there were too many yes. farmers, there's too many main streets in America, mm -hmm. and there's too many CEDs, in my, in my opinion, for anybody to come out and say a, a thing like that. Ed, uh, you're acquainted with the Mueller report. I'd like to have your comments on it. Well, Bill, the Mueller report was gotten up when uh, uh, Mr. Mueller was, uh, economist Mueller was a, with the Federal Trade Commission chief economist. And he made a, a study that uh, really amounted to about a thousand pages to try to uh, find out just where the concentration was and what effect it was having on the entire economic uh, life of our country and where it was leading to it. And he found that about 200 corporations really were in control of our entire na national economy. That whatever, maybe, like for instance, when the General Motors Company goes on strike, 
35,000 contractors are affected with that strike. All of the dealers that sell the cars, all of the people that, that collect taxes in various areas, the various communities. Now, he tried to point out, I think, in his way, that if four or five of these giant corporations and this giant union control over them, if that went haywire all at once, that there was enough economic power there to destroy our entire economy, that there would be no way to put them in jail. Uh, what could you do with such power turned loose in the marketplace? Now, Mueller feels the same as we do with, with the National Federation of Independent Business and also the resolutions that have been passed by NFO, that it's time for an unwinding program. Uh, it began with the General Motors separation of DuPont. <coughs> now, this could go on to the General Motors separation of GMAC, for example. Maybe Cadillac and Chevrolet could be put on their own feet. Uh, maybe we could put Maxwell House Coffee, Chase and Sanborn, uh, Minna Tapioca, Jell-O, all these different companies that people are familiar with, back on their own feet again and start unwinding these gigantic corporate combines as Henry Luce of, to of Fortune magazine rep uh, recommended in 1935. Well, are we able to do this, Ed? For example, the Lytton case. Does this prove that we are able to do it? Well, the Lytton case, of course, was mostly a public opinion case. Uh, when they announced that they were going to open up 100 gigantic shopping centers and said in their own literature that within five years they would have 85 percent of the farm business and most of the town business in all of the agricultural areas. We all got together, uh, NFO leaders and, and myself, and we made speeches all over Nebraska and Iowa, Illinois, Michigan. We pointed out to the people through radio, television, and by the way, the cooperation from the television stations, radio, newspapers was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. We pointed out to the people what this one giant could do by moving into all of these areas with these great big shopping centers. And at the end of a year and a half, with the help of the Independent Bankers Association, NARD and the rest of them, and, and with our own efforts, they announced that they were not going to go ahead with their program. Now, this was a public relations victory. The victory that we had with Procter & Gamble, for instance, and, and Clorox, separating those, that was strictly a legislative victory. Mm -hmm. And that came out of the Kefauver Seller Bill, which was passed in 1950. Now, I feel, from what I'm able to learn, that there's going to be about 20 big monopoly cases that are going to be announced in 1971 that will be a sort of a decentralization uh, uh, ca cases. If we, can, if we can decentralize and get back to rural America, now they're talking about opening up factories. Uh, Don Clawson, a congressman from New York, has got a bill and in fact, he's got it through the House and the Senate to allow more money for rural roads so that these factories can be induced into, into the country. But what concerns me is two things. First of all, the talk that we need to open up a factory in some small town so that the farmer's wife can go to work and the children can go to work or the farmer can go to work and make enough money to keep the farm going. To me, this is the most outrageous uh, thinking that we could possibly get, that here's a, a farm that is entitled to its share of the market so that that wonderful farm mother can be there and raise those wonderful kids, mm -hmm. which they have been doing, and, and do all of the church work that they do. And How often do you hear of juvenile delinquency in, in rural America? Hardly ever. Yet here they're talking about bringing these kids to town or putting them to work in factories and letting this rural America life die because everything's going to be big corporate farms. Th this, this kind of thinking is like everything's going to be big corporations in the corporate field and big unions and big governments until finally when we get up to July the 4th, 1976, the 200th birthday of our Declaration of Independence, we're not going to be standing on the curb with our hats off and the whole world is not going to be looking to America. I, I think that this 200th birthday, the first time that a republic has ever even come approached that many years, that to me it's the greatest event since Christ uh, moved the stone and came from the tomb. It's the biggest event, could be the biggest event in 2,000 years. If we don't turn this, this racial problem around, if we don't get these kids straightened out in their thinking. You know, some boy said uh, that he's studying geometry because uh, his, his uh, parents are going around in circles and that they're squares. Now, they think this is about government. And to me, these young people today that are so concerned about our social conditions, and I'm not talking about the barefooted ones and the long hair, there's even some brains among them, really. But the, the average school student, high school and college student that I talk to across the country, these kids could be the greatest force for, for saving this country of ours and making this July 4th thing a tremendous celebration. 
If they knew what the Jeffersonian philosophy is, if they knew what this family farm, small business, local bank thing means to them to strike out on their own and to be able to open up a store or have a farm and say, this is mine. You know, this is mine is something, this is capitalism. Uh, I use a, a little story sometimes. I, I talked to a labor union in Detroit and I knew I had an antagonistic audience because I was representing a business organization and I was talking to a labor union. So therefore, all I was going to talk about is capitalism and labor. See. And I said, I want you to go down to Alabama with me. And this was back in the days when the things were tough in Alabama. And I said, a little colored boy is walking down the street with a shoe shine box. And he's looking up at the faces of the people in the street and he's saying, shine, sir, shine, sir. I said, somebody puts their foot up on the box and he starts his little job. I said, that little fella is a capitalist. He's just as much of a capitalist as John D. Rockefeller. And if you guys own an automobile or you're paying on a home or you can say anything that you have, but this is mine, you're a capitalist. Now, I want to talk to you about capitalism. Do you want to, capitalism, do you want to listen? I had one of the most wonderful audiences that I ever had. And before I said that, I had an antagonistic audience. Mm -hmm. Now, you go into these, mm -hmm. these college schools and what do they do? The boys bring out their pads right away and they're ready to destroy you because they know you're going to talk about free enterprise, they know because I've had the advanced billing. And pretty soon they look at each other kind of bewildered and they don't know what to, to think. And I know what's in their face and what's in their mind. They're saying, my gosh, what are we going to do? This guy's on our side. And this is what these kids have got to know is that we're on their side. And then they'll come on our side more than they are. The old and the young in America today, this is the communication gap. It's between the parent and the son. How could it be otherwise between the politician and the young people? And this Kent thing that we had, those are just terrible incidents, like the, the Vietnam War. It's caused the kids to change their ideas about religion. It's caused them to change their ideas about government, about democracy, everything, because we haven't settled it. And another thing the kids don't seem to understand is that if we're going to clear up the slums, we've got to take the slum out of the people before we take them out of the slums, or we're just going to create more slums. So our priorities have been in reverse. Bill, this is, this is my story. I'm stuck with it. I think that Jefferson, that when, when Jack Kennedy said that to that tremendous audience of educators that he had at the White House, and he got up and he said, there's the greatest aggregation of, of educators and, we and wealth of, of, uh, of um, I think he, he, he said some education and knowledge they ever gathered in this White House except the morning that Thomas Jefferson sat down to breakfast alone. <laughs> it's a and wonderful quote. This is the way, I feel, about, is the way yes. I feel about Jefferson. Yes. And I think if I, we could get our kids to study Jefferson and get our people to understand better what Jefferson stood for, uh, we wouldn't need to worry about this July the 4th, but yes. believe me, we've got to worry right now. Ed, you tell a wonderful story about another antagonistic audience you spoke to once. Uh, this, I think, occurred close to one of NFO's holding actions. Perhaps it was the milk holding action. Perhaps it was the hog incident. But do you recall that story? Well, Bill, I tell you, that was one of the most uh, unusual experiences I think that I ever had. It was about the second day of the milk dumping. Everything had been on, on television showing all these farmers out there pouring this milk down the gutter. And I'm there to talk about the family farm, small business, local bank getting together. And very probably at no time that I'd, in my whole 32 years, or 38 years, had I run into a situation where the businessmen were more antagonistic to the farmer than they were on that day. So the president of the club said to me, you're not going to be talking too much about these farmers today, are you? He said, that's what you're always yelling about. And he said, uh, you can't imagine the feeling here. And I said, I know what the feeling is. So while I was eating my dinner, I thought, I've got to have something real good. So the first question that I asked him was, is anybody here mad at those guys that dumped that tea in the ocean? And I said, come on, there must be somebody here that's <laughs> mad. And they didn't know what I was driving at. And I said, well, gentlemen, I'm just as frightened over this thing as you or anybody else could possibly be. When I see men dumping the, the sweat of their brow, their labor, their product into a gutter in order to draw attention of the people to their plight, in order to hang on to their land, to raise their kids, and not be driven out of their homes. I said, we're in an awful bad fix. And I said, the way I would think about this if I was you, is that when those farmers go, and they're going by the countless thousands, 
the main streets of this town are going to be empty and there isn't going to be any bank here to be doing any business. And I'm wondering what we're going to be able to do with these schools and churches that are all empty. So let us stop and think for a minute. These men are trying to get the attention of Congress. They're trying to get the attention mm -hmm. of the people. Now, whether this is the right way or the wrong way, I don't know. I'm frightened by it by what's happening. But let us not be too quick in our judgment. And you know, I got a standing ovation from that crowd. And uh, really, it went to show that here was a whole audience of men that were antagonistic, and 30 minutes later, they had understanding. Yes. And, and I feel that here is understanding. There's no word like it that there is, an understanding of people. If you knew me as I knew you, you know the old, the poem that was, what a different world we would have. And uh, I saw a, a picture one time, a silent uh, film uh, with, uh, no, it wasn't silent, but it was in the uh, days before uh, color. It was Cary Grant, and Ethel Barrymore was the star. And this Cary Grant was walking down the street in the fog in, in London. And he, <coughs> there was a guy on a, on a, uh, uh, on, the, in, on the Thames, on the river, all humped up on the back bank of the river. And, and he mumbled, I saw <coughs> what I thought was an animal. Look, I can't get, keep from getting a little emotional on this kind of stuff every time I tell it because I can see it and hear it. And this was over 20 years ago. I, thought, I saw what I thought was an animal. Looking a little closer, I discovered it was a man. Looking still closer, I found it was my brother. And you know, this whole world of ours with these Indian problems that we've got and the colored problem and the, the yellow problem, it's all a case of us looking closer and we discover that he is our brother. And I think that this brotherhood of independent farmers, independent businessmen, independent bankers and the workers and the politicians, if it doesn't build up in America to a point where it can turn this crazy world around and meet this communism and socialism threat this welfare state threat. Is there any other country in the world that has the wealth and the power? Is there any other country in the world that's got a constitution, a bill of rights, a declaration of independence like we have to build on, which is spiritual, economic, and political progress as it has never been spelled out in the history of the world? Ed, in your travels and in your contacts as vice president of NFIB, I'm sure you talk with politicians and congressmen. What is their general attitude toward the plight of the independent farmer? Well, I tell you, answering your first question first, I do keep in contact with members of Congress every day, no matter where I am, in one mm -hmm. form or another, and so does our organization. And I can say with all honesty to the, anybody that is listening to us at this time that there has never been in my experience of all this uh, third of a century or more so many sincere men in our House and Senate and in all government, for that matter, that are concerned, deeply concerned, over where we're going. It's a matter, again, of communication between the people on the land and in business and everything and the policy makers. If they can get their thinking straightened out, the people in the country can get straightened out on their thinking in the business community, we got a better chance with this Congress than we've ever had. Ed, I want to thank you very much for being my special guest on this week's U.S. Farm Report. It's been our pleasure. Well, I tell you, coming back here to NFO headquarters, this is my second time here. And, of course, they've had a lot of expansion, you know, since I was here. And finding the spirit of the people that uh, work here, uh, there's a dedication which is absolutely essential. Now, with the conditions that our country is in and will be in all through 1971, there is great discouragement among all people with their organizations. Uh, the colored people are discouraged with the progress that uh, their organizations have made. Uh, I think probably 50% of the farmers that felt a lot of hope two years ago are, are wondering now just how strong their organizations are and where they've gotten. Now, if these people would stop to think that, for instance, the stockbrokers, if you had said to Hayden Stone or Blair or Goodbody or any of those people a year ago that they would be bankrupt today, uh, that they would be on sort of a, a Wall Street welfare list, why, they would have thought that that was the biggest joke on earth. But that's where they are. They're, they're closing their offices. Their salesmen are out into the streets. And then when you go to, to, to New York, for instance, and you find a million people on relief, you find uh, 150,000 people going through Manhattan courts 
uh, through just for the crimes, and 80% of them young people. And then you discover that there's 70,000 young girls under 17, most of them under 15, that are pregnant without, without husbands. Uh, you say, well, how could you ever lick a problem like that? And the, the feeling in New York is that they need $100 billion just to lick the problems of New York. Well, those problems got there because of neglect, and only because we can understand them and work together on them will they ever be eliminated. Now, I hear colored people, you know, talk about no progress. Right? From the very beginning, the colored race has made more progress than, than any other minority in the history of the world. And they should be sh pointing out to their children how much, how many of them are clergymen, how many of them are doctors, how many of them are lawyers, how far they've come in, in sports, and how far they've come in entertainment. And, and point out to these kids objects of pride so that they will feel proud of their race. I think the same thing needs to be done with the Indians, that they've got to be given some more hope. Now, when we go over into a, an organization like NFO, or our National Federation of Independent Business, and we call, and our men go up and down the street, and the small businessman says, I'm worse off this year than I was last year. When I joined your organization, I thought I was going to get so-and-so. Mm -hmm. Well, as soon as he begins to understand the whole picture, he begins to realize that without NFO, without NFIB, without the bankers' organization, without the NAACP or whatever, any, any other kind of an organization you want, how much worse off would we be? And here is where I get my big thrill, is when I come in and find a whole lot of people, like there is around Corning here, that are all doing their job and they're out showing films. And these, these farm wives, you know, I mentioned the wives of NFO, I call them my carry nation. <laughs> I've talked to, the, to their organizations all over the country, and those gals carry banners, and they cook meals, and they're so charming and everything. I wish that, that the, uh, in fact, I fall in love with all of them. My wife is wondering how it's possible that I, <laughs> that I do. And uh, they're, so, they're so filled with a desire to stay on their land and raise their kids. We can't let them down. Ed, thank you again. Bill, well, thank you. Yes, sir. This week, my very special guest on U.S. Farm Report has been Mr. Ed Wimmer, Vice President of the National Federation of Independent Business. U.S. Farm Report is seen on this station each week at this same time. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.